Welcome again, and thank you. I see a lot of, of familiar names and faces on this call, so we're excited to have you with us again. Um, my name is Jennifer Cohen. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Baltimore and one of the co-founders of the CARP Research Lab. We are presenting this webinar on character assassination scandals and crisis communication in conjunction with the Scandology Research Initiative. And so um, I am joined by my CARP co-founders, Sergei Samuelenko of George Mason University, Martin Ix of the University of Amsterdam, and Eric Shrive, also from George Mason University. And we have Hendrik and Andre from the Scandology Research Initiative as well. And you all got to hear a lot about their work last um, last week when we got together. As many of you all know, CARP Lab is an interdisciplinary research institute looking into character assassination and reputation management. And we're so excited to see so many of you who have contributed to our handbook of character assassination and reputation management. And um, thank you to so many of you for wonderful conversations about our most recent uh, primer on character assassination and reputation management, both from Rutledge. As you also know from last week, um, we were uh, lucky enough to welcome and to be partnering with the Scandology Research Initiative, who has hosted uh, three international conferences and published three volumes of work on the study of scandals in our society. So here's images from the first international conference and some familiar faces presenting at um, one of their more recent conferences as well. And they're really uh, setting a driving research agenda for uh, pursuing the study of, of scandals in a variety of different contexts. Um, we'll be sure to share the link at the end of our conversation today, but they are also hosting a conference um, in uh, Bomberg to look at political scandals in the age of populism, partisanship, and polarization, the three Ps that are very relevant <laughs> to, uh, you know, political and mediated life today. Now, we're excited to hear from them and from some of the members of, of CARP Lab, but we've invited you here this week, actually, to hear from a really special guest um, whose work really sits at the intersection of scandals and crisis communication and has a lot of resonance for character assassination as well. Um, and so if you've uh, carefully looked at both the uh, Rutledge Handbook of Character Assassination and looked at some of the Scandology volumes as well, you'll find Timothy Coombs' work in there. And so certainly crisis communication and reputation management really sit at the intersection of scandals and character assassination, which is why we were really excited to welcome him to share some of his expertise today. If you don't know Tim Coombs, he's the George T. and Gladys H. Abel Professor in Liberal Arts at Texas A&M University, where he's also a full professor in the Department of Communication. You probably know him from situational crisis communication theory. Um, he has won too many awards for me to count and published too many articles and too many books uh, to count as well, but certainly a recognized expert in crisis communication from places like the National Communication Association, um, and certainly an expert in classes on uh, teaching on crisis management, corporate communication, public relations, and reputation and identity management. So I'm going to turn it over to him in one second here, but before I do, just want to lay a few ground rules here, nothing uh, groundbreaking and, and stuff that I'm sure you are all used to doing from our, our lives on Zoom, but just I would ask you to uh, please uh, stay muted uh, just so we avoid background noise. We would love to get a great conversation going in the chat, and I will try as we move toward the end of our conversation to draw in as many of your comments and questions as I can. So please uh, get that chat going with questions and comments for our, our speaker. Um, 
And I will leave some time for, for Q&A at the end. As you all know, we're recording this, this webinar. So if that changes how you want to interact or what have you, um, you know, do what you got to do. But um, we really want to share the scholarship and the great conversation that we have together. And I know it will be great because it was really, truly wonderful uh, to get to talk to so many of you all last week as well. And now we get to welcome our esteemed guest, Tim Coombs. So welcome, Tim. I'm just going to kick it off by diving into a conversation about crisis. Um, can you tell us a little bit about studying crises and reputational crises and you know, what kind of things you think about in doing that research? Sure, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's, it's great to get a chance to, to talk to you all because it's, it's a fascinating way kind of how, how this all comes in and around crisis. And if you think about it at its heart, kind of a crisis is disruption. And I focus on organizational crisis, and we'll be talking about those today. And so it's, it's a disruption or it's a threat of a disruption to the organization. And it's created by the organization violating expectations of its stakeholders. So at its heart, it's driven by the stakeholders because it's their perceptions. And this gets back to kind of the social construction nature of it all. And so when that occurs and there is this disruption, Sometimes that there's an operational component to it, and that's what first attracted management people to the field, but there's also a reputational component to it as well. That not, not only do I, for instance, if I have to recall my product that I put out bad lettuce, it's contaminated with E. coli, so I got to get it off the market. Well, yeah, there's an operational concern there, but there's also then reputational damage. Like, eh, do I want to buy your lettuce or do I even want to buy lettuce at all in the future are questions that, that get asked. And that's where the reputation part comes in. And what we've seen lady, lately are what are called reputational crises. And I, I like to call them para crises because they're really risks that you're trying to manage. And that just to kind of draw more of a separation between what's a real crisis when I assemble the crisis team and when I need to just kind of manage risks. And the pair crises are like that because there's a threat to your reputation. It can be tarnished. It hasn't yet risen to the point where it's going to disrupt my organization, but it could. It, it could accelerate it in those areas. And that's a lot where you see the first elements of character assassination comes in, that these pair crises are often based in that idea of a character attack. I'm going to go after the organization's character. I'm going to reveal them mostly as being irresponsible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in a moral component to it all. And that's a, an, an interesting distinction that's been emerging in, in various literatures and kind of coming into crisis as well is that, yeah, I can have a competence-based crisis. You know, I, I, I recall my lettuce because I'm just not really good at cleaning lettuce, or it's a moral concern. I don't care because I'm trying to save money and, and I just put out whatever product I can. And so there's different ways of doing it. And that moral component comes in as well. And, and as, a, as we'll talk later today, I think that's where a lot of this, the ideas from scandology and character assassination can, can come into play. Yeah, excellent, excellent. One of the things that we have have often thought about and written about as uh, we study character assassination is exactly what you just said, that moral component as we think about someone uh, being either in the right or in the wrong with their character. Um, you know, lettuce is something that is very dangerous and none of us should really be buying. Um, that's a, a great, a great uh, distinction between operational crises that, that cause certain types of disruptions and reputational ones. Now, I mentioned situational crisis communication theory as, as something that you're really well known for, but certainly that has a lot to uh, teach us when we think about responding to crises. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, this theory that you've developed and what its main assumptions and components are? I wish that had a catchier name, so you just kind of wind up abbreviating it at SCCT. And generally, it's the, the idea that there are, as crises emerge, you really need to read the cues in the crisis situation to understand what's an optimal response. And an optimal response is one that benefits both the stakeholders who are injured by the crisis, as well as the organization in crisis. You have these two interests to come together for that. So that's why it, it's situational. And it's, it draws from a lot of literature to say, really, the situation is important in shaping how you should respond to it, not only in communication, but also in psychology. And underlying it all is the notion that it, there's still a social construction to crises. But what we do, particularly in strategic communication, corporate communication, is you look for what do most people think and feel. 
And that's how you address it. And so with situational crisis communication, theory, we're not saying like everyone always sees things the same way, but most people will see a crisis a particular way. So I need to respond to that. And really that, that, that undergirds all of strategic communication is that idea of social construction because if, uh, no one would say, oh, I, I say X and 100% of the people do something. There's always perceptions that gets filtered through that. And really at the center of, of SCCT is empathy because that's where it all begins. You have to have empathy for the victims. If you fail that part of it, you really fail as a crisis communicator. And the idea is we talk about the ethical base response where you tell people how to protect themselves physically and how to help them recover sort of psychologically from the crisis. And that's a focus on the victims. And you do that before you ever engage in any reputation building efforts. The, the biggest mistakes organizations make is they skip that stage and like, oh, I'm just going to go and work on my reputation. And you think about BP during the Gulf, that was their problem. They, they forgot about the victims. And along the way, your communication needs to consider accountability. And a lot of companies are good at dancing around accountabilities. And there are even some theories in public, in, in, in crisis communication, if you look at them, they also try to skirt accountability. And you need, you need to embrace your accountability. That's part of it. The empathy and the accountability are, are critical to all of that. And that becomes the central part from that. And you learn how to read the cues by identifying salient features within the environment. We talk about attributions of responsibility. And lately we've also been looking at more of a moral component of, of looking at how moral outrage might be triggered from the reading of the, of the situation. So it's understanding the situation to figure out what is your most optimal response. Also knowing sometimes I don't have an optimal response option. So what are some okay options? <laughs> you know, what's not bad? for you in crisis communication. Excellent, thank you, thank you. That certainly resonates with a lot of uh, the work done in my home discipline of rhetoric too, in terms of thinking about what is the fitting response to the, the rhetorical situation. And I definitely appreciate as well the, the need to think about victims from an empathy-based perspective before going on to manage those, those reputational crises, which may come from, from character attacks or from some uh, variety of operational uh, irresponsibility. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the character of organizations. We've had a lot of debates among CARP Lab about whether it really is possible to launch a character attack against a corporation or an organization. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about whether organizations can even have characters in the same way that we think about reputation um, of you know, an organization or a, a company. So can you share your thoughts on character attacks against organizations and whether we can think about organizations as, as having characters? We kind of share a common root with that. Uh, a lot of the research on crisis communication came out of corporate apologia, which was an extension of apologia coming out of politics on, on the, from the rhetorical side. You know, it's, uh, it's going back to the seventies, but it, they started to make the argument that, well, we can apply this to organizations, that corporations have a character and they can be attacked and they can be defended. And that was controversial at the time. And the first piece written by Deanna Suppos and Bibbert back in the 80s was a defense of that, saying, no, you, you can do this. Because that was the very early days. In the 80s is when corporations and corporate communication first began to say, hey, maybe there's this character and what then became reputation. And nowadays we talk more broadly as this idea of, of social uh, social assessment that organizations have, that there is, people do have these sort of collective perceptions about the organization and that they're good or they're bad. And you can think of them in, in terms of character. Now, now if, you, if you wanna be very specific about character, maybe it doesn't fit perfectly, but there's enough of an overlap to say, yes, it does, because organizations now view that as a very central sort of asset to themselves. They didn't, even as late as the 90s, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, reputation, now that's that kind of nebulous thing out there that may or may not have any value for us, but they now know it has value. And as an asset, well, that's something that needs to be protected. And now it can be threatened 
And I think character attacks, the way of looking at how it is being threatened, that you systematically go after them and they, you go after them again on irresponsibility to, to sort of unmask them and show they are irresponsible. And why is that important? Because resp social responsibility is now the dominant component for most compositions of reputational measures. You know, and if you look at sort of the Reputation Institute, and they'll tell you, well, yeah, that's the strongest component now. Because it used to be, Lisa, uh, it was all financial. It's like, you know, how are your stocks doing? How good are your managers? It's all on the financial side. But now they're like, no, no, it's the social side that really matters. And again, that starts drawing in that moral component as well as how are you behaving as an organization? And that has changed very dramatically uh, nowadays. So I, I think you can argue it, but... You can argue for the character attacks, but you know I, I I understand when people say no, so there's here's really what character means, so it's not quite a perfect fit. So there, so there's room. I, I think there's room for debate because I think that debate still goes on in, in some some areas within with our uh, within public relations as well. Like, well, can you really say attack their character or not? Yeah, it certainly is the case, though, as you say, that that perceptions of reputation matter greatly for organizations and corporations. I actually want to to pivot now to drawing in uh, some some carp and scandology voices here. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether organizations have have character and how character attacks on corporations or organizations might be different from those on um, individuals. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, pivot to Serge here and then we'll hear what Andre has to say. Hey, uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, well, the way we'll look uh, in our CARP lab at what is reputation, what is character, uh, obviously uh, as you know, social constructs, and we obviously look at you know character in many ways as a public image, which is more appropriate term used in public relations and crisis communication. And we we'll look at reputation as a sum of those images, because obviously we're talking about reputations plural, uh, and we'll look at different social contexts, and we'll look at different uh, sociocultural context, uh, whether, you know, someone's reputation as a, a perfect husband and a perfect family man is different from his professional uh, reputation, in a sense, right, as, as a leader. And we'll also look at, you know, personal traits as opposed to social function. Okay, well, there might be a good person, a nice, kind guy. However, what is he as a leader? Uh, and the way uh, he's supposed to lead a certain organization or to be elected for a high official post. So obviously there is a lot of a lot of room for um, conversation here. And I uh, side with another scholar, Peter Sandman, who is talking about uh, a person in an organization can have good and bad reputation at the same time. So and it's a matter of perception. Excellent, excellent. So thinking about uh, those public images from the, the perspective of a public relations scholar. Thank you, Serge. Andre, what say the scandologists? I'm trying to, to argue like a, an organizational um, communication scientist. So could um, the term organizational culture maybe be the, the better term for character? I'm thinking, uh, um, um, about um, you know the communicated um, organizational culture because um, many people think there are evil companies for example like Amazon because it's uh, it's publicly known that um, they are not uh, yeah treating their workers so so good. <laughs> Yeah, so thinking about organizational culture, uh, which spills over into thinking about, you know, uh, labor and and workers um, as as one other way of of getting at the the question of whether organizations themselves have kind of this fundamental character that we think about with uh, individuals. Uh, your point is really well taken, Andre, that there certainly are organizations that we tend to think of as, as evil and these, these behemoths. And it seems like today, a lot of them fall in the realm of, of tech companies and stuff. But um, it is, I think, certainly the case, as, as Tim pointed out, that whether we want to call it um, character or public image or some type of, of reputation that there are some similar dynamics uh, operating here when we think about attacking organizations or corporations. Um, Hendrik, you wanted to weigh in? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you, Jenny. And uh, thanks, Kim, uh, Tim, for the um, uh, uh, overview you gave us. What I wondered is what kind of factors is character attributed to? I mean, Andre just mentioned it. Yeah, the treatment of the workforce is currently a huge factor that um, influences how kind of corporations are viewed, especially in the United States. And that is not even tied to um, uh, irresponsibility or even a scandal, but that's just uh, evolved out of a very, very pragmatic need for uh, yeah, that you have a lack of workers, especially in those fields that are not way well paid. And the, um, that is just one example where uh, there is no, where well, there is a crisis, but it's not uh, connected to a character of the uh, corporation and it's not connected to a, a, a scandal like a health hazard with a lettuce or something like that. So what, what, what would you say about that? How, how is this cultural context uh, search and Andre talked about uh, related to this character of corporations? It sounds like that's a question for you, Tim. Do you have thoughts there? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you raise a good question about what is a character about what, and that's kind of what the, when they ask about a reputation, it's like, oh, you have a reputation. Well, a reputation for what among whom? And that, that becomes variable. And that's the challenge for modern corporations is that because you are dealing with so many diverse stakeholders out there, even within like a stakeholder category, like customers are so diverse, you're always gonna get multiple points. So the question of that there are multiple, both good and bad reputations is a very valid one. And one that had never been dismissed that you know, everyone would always talk about reputation, but we always knew it was reputation as plural, but they're now more specifically talking about, really we're talking about both good and bad. That you, Some people are gonna love you and some people are gonna hate you no matter what you do. And Amazon's a good example of that. Some people love Amazon, some people hate Amazon, but often people who both love and hate Amazon both use Amazon. So it's it, it becomes a question because part of it is like, why do you, why do you affiliate with an, with an organization? And we like to think, oh, because you treat me fairly because we have a good relationship. But a lot of times like, no, it's, it's really convenience and price, right? That's all we really want. I mean, why do people fly Ryanair? Well, it's not the customer service. It's not because they're valued and they really think highly of you. It's because you can get from A to B for a really low price and maybe that's all you wanna pay for it. But it, 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 does, it does raise like the culture can shape that and the, and the culture does shape what matters for the character of an organization. And that changes over time. And I think that's one of the, the key elements is I think that character assassination attempts on corporations are bellwethers, they're warnings, like this could be important. And that's the challenge that managers face is like, is this something that could be important in the future? Or is this just kind of a handful of people who have a really kind of different view of the world and we don't need to worry about them. But it can be these warning signs and organizations move much quicker. And a good illustration of that is if you look at how corporations came under fire decades ago for the use of you know, forced labor, slave labor, sweatshop labor within the supply chain. Suddenly that mattered. And you know, Nike became the poster for that because they were they were the biggest one and you always go out to the top. Well, now they're like, oh, suddenly people care about this? Really? It's like all we seemed to care about before was getting your stuff for a good price. And now suddenly you care about this, like, okay. And now we take it for granted that up, upstream, downstream in your supply chain, you're responsible for that. And what happens matters and reflects upon you as an organization. And you're, you're held to agree, going back, accountability uh, for all of that. Flash forward to today, when you saw things hit from the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matters, things happen much faster. And because they saw, yeah, this is, this is a warning sign. This is something we need to embrace. And I think that's what you're starting to see is you're starting to assess these threats, these risks coming from these character attacks differently now to try and, and see how, how they might impact and come forward because the culture changes. And with that comes changes in expectations of what you, of how you need to behave as, as an organization. And I, I think, you know, going back to that notion of culture does have a sense of it. Some companies have really bad, what we, you know, 
the literature for years referred to it as toxic cultures. And those are problematic, those, those toxic types of cultures, because those reflect the true identity. Because at the heart of reputation really is the identity, who the organization is. And there are so many different terms to capture that, but essentially like, how, who do you reveal yourself as being? Because as an organization, you always know, think, oh, we're, we're a certain thing. Well, it doesn't matter what you think you are. It's how your stakeholders perceive you that matter. But that culture can be a, a good way of reflecting that and really kind of revealing your identity to others. Or Excellent, excellent. I was also thinking about um, environmental protections and sort of an investment in offsetting the environmental harm of doing business as something that has um, grabbed in the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, public attention. And so now we do tend to take for granted that organizations would at least attempt to minimize their environmental impact, whereas, you know, that's something we wouldn't have, have cared about a long time ago. Um, I also appreciate uh, Serge's point about how um, an organization can have many positive um, sort of marks in their, their bank account and many negative ones at the same time that people can sort of hold the good and the bad. And I think that gets back to what uh, Tim, you were saying about the convenience, right? Whether you like an organization or not, if it's convenient, um, you may continue to, to use their services or purchase their, their products. Um, so a lot to think about when we think about the character, public image, or reputation of an organization. I want to shift gears a little bit um, to get into uh, more about how things become scandals. So can you tell us about the, your new theory of scansis, where we sort of put together the idea of scandals and crises? What are the main components or assumptions there? And that was actually motivated by the first Scandology conference, kind of how to kind of think of all these things together. Is it, and it really triggered something that became very meaningful for, for, for the research in this area, and I think it will play out. And that was to really start to embrace the moral component to all of this. And we focus on the emotion, the newly kind of emerging found emotion of moral outrage. There had been a debate in the emotion literature, does this exist or not? Isn't this just anger? It's like, no, it's, it's, it's something unique. And the moral outrage is a combination of injustice and they talked about greed, but I think it's better to think about it as exploitation. So not only was an injustice done, but it was done intentionally with the idea to exploit that stakeholder group in some way. And we, they, they originally defined it as greed. And you can look at corporations like you know, Wells Fargo. Why did they create these secret accounts? Because they were making money off of their customers. And there are those types of exploitations. But when you look at some, some of the larger discrimination suits that are going on that you see out there, that's a different type of exploitation, but it's still exploitation and it can still trigger moral outrage. And moral outrage is a very unique emotion and it brings with it, and I you know, argue, it it's fundamentally changes the nature of the crisis situation when you start looking at the moral side of it. Because competence crises are actually fairly easy to handle. You hire better people, you fix your practices, and sometimes you just fire bad people. And that's why companies like say, it, it was so-and-so, you know, Bob did it, we'll fire <laughs> Bob and the world will be a great, you know, our company is great again. But it's like, no, it, it, there's, there are some, there can be fundamentally flawed issues. And this goes back to the culture of the organization where we need that much bigger changes need to be going on here is that you oftentimes will find out, well, this industrial accident was a result of a lax safety culture. Why was it a lax safety culture? Well, management was cutting corners. So injustice, you know, exploitation le leading to all this. And those Moral outrage is what they call a hot cognition. And a hot cognition really brings things to the forefront out of this cognitive appraisal theory. And it brings out these emotions and they become powerful drivers then within the crisis. And it, as I said, it disrupts our, the typical view of crisis and what works in a crisis. We look at common crisis outcomes such as, well, what's my post-crisis reputation? What's purchase attention? And no longer does communication you know, what we would refer to as optimal communication matter for those anymore. Because the crisis is bad and people for a time are gonna be really upset and they're not gonna move on those. So what you need to do is you have to shift your focus from short-term to long-term investment with your strategies and your outcomes need to reflect that as well. 
to kind of come back to that. So it, it's this, this, this moral track just really changes things. And that becomes important because if you look at tracking being done by the, the, the Institute for Crisis Management, most of the media coverage in the United States focuses on crises that would fall under this category of creating moral outrage. So that's what we really know about. So it's not as though they're not the most in number, but they're most in terms of attention. And they become much more challenging for crisis managers to manage in some way. And that's, that's kind of the direction we've gone with the scantus because the scantus is kind of at the height of that. It just feels like, yeah, this isn't just a crisis. This is a scandal because it's there's a, a strong moral component to this as, as well. And the stronger that moral component and that perception is by the stakeholders, the more challenging it becomes for crisis managers to manage those crises because it's, it's hard. Uh, part of it is you, you need to be able to account. This is where his accountability comes back in because you need to be accountable and really sort of, um, uh, as one set of authors called, embrace the pain. Because that's the only way to get through. So you have you have to come forward and you have to say, "This is what we did. We know this is wrong." Because if you skirt accountability, yeah, you can just throw out an apology and talk about, "Oh, we're going to do this in the future. We're going to be a much better organization." But you've never admitted that you you know what you did was wrong and why it was wrong, and that really becomes critical in the moral component. Because well, what we found in the data so far is when you do that, that's when people start responding more favorably to you is they want to see that recognition that's that's uh, of, of your failures as opposed to just I'm just going to throw you out an apology and everything's fine. Excellent, excellent. And certainly um, for those of you that were with us last week, the central component of moral outrage as a key function of scandals, I think is, is really important. And we talked about that a lot last week. I wanna ask one more question to Tim and then um, direct our conversation a little bit more to, to Scandology and CARP, and then we'll jump into some, some audience questions. Um, but I'm curious, you know, this is something that we get asked a lot as scholars of character assassination, and certainly we talked about it last week in, in relation to scandals as well, but um, what is the role of social media and sort of online uh, presence for organizations as a way of uh, maybe catalyzing or uh, speeding up the moral outrage that can occur when organizations mess up? So what, what's new here in regards to social media? Now, I think what social media brings to it is an ease and a speed that we haven't seen before. There have always been these challenges to organizations in terms of con confronting their, their, their moral failings. You, you know, boycotts have been around, I, I think, for over 300 years. And that, that's, a, that's a component of a, why do you boycott? Because you're, you're trying to make a point about something that's out there. And activist groups prior to the digital environment, which actually did exist for, for quite a long period of time, it was media advocacy and um, direct action. So you were going to go out in person to do a pro protest, and usually that was then tied to some kind of media advocacy to get attention. That was hard to do because the media would cover your event, but then it's like, oh, look at the crazy people protesting, and they wouldn't talk about what your issues were. And that, that was very common. If you go back even to the protests looking at the protest movement in the 70s, the anti-war ones in the US, that, that was a general failure. The point was lost because you create a spectacle to get attention and then your message disappears. Through social media, you can reach people faster and you can reach them more directly and you can get your message across directly and much more clearly now. So you no longer have to go through gatekeepers through the media to get it out there. You go directly to people. Now, there's both good and bad in that. You know, as, as time goes by, we see the value of journalism being a gatekeeper because things get represented as if they are true. And uh, the, biggest, the biggest failing you see in social media is no one's there to hold you accountable. A gatekeeper holds you accountable. And again, we're coming back to accountability. But that comes, that comes out in social media. And I think the social media, again, is this ability to hold organizations accountable when they make mistakes. So you have this ease, the spread, and directness that you didn't have prior to that. It was a lot harder to engage in these types of attacks previously. And social media... Uh, makes it easier. That doesn't mean they're always successful. I, you know, people will always act like um, 
oh, wow, all you have to do is have a Twitter account and you can bring down a corporation. Like, I ah, know that's not how it works. I mean, if you think of the number of groups out there and individuals who are attacking various corporations, the success rate is really very, very low. I mean, it's hard to put a number on it, but it's not that high. But we, we tend to focus on these and like, like that's what always happens. Look at, look at what they did. It's like, no, that, that's probably not going to happen. But the threat is always out there. And that's one of the challenges for managers nowadays is to assess social media because they've now come around that social media is important, but what in social media is important? And it's getting better. The metrics they have to assess that in terms of what they're being offered by vendors in terms of monitoring social media is getting better for them to answer those types of questions. But it, that, the, for me, that I see that's what the big change has been. Nice. I appreciate that point. We talk a lot about how social media has democratized the field of character assassination. You no longer need a printing press or access to airwaves to, to bring down people. Um, but nonetheless, your point is really well taken. You know, me tweeting about my delayed flight is not going to bring down American <laughs> Airlines, even if I have many, many <laughs> followers. I want to put the scandologists on the spot here a little bit. We've been talking about scandals and, and moral outrage and the amplifying impacts of social media potentially. Um, do you folks have thoughts about how the theory of scansis adds to, to your research into scandals or other things you want to add about this dimension here? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. First of all, I'd like to um, come back to the, the concept of uh, social media in crisis because there's another um, a huge instrument um, which is really really um, negative can be negative for organizations and uh, these are uh, whistleblowing platforms it's a completely new completely new concept a completely new instrument in uh, scandalizing or criticizing corporations if you think about uh, in, in germany for example the politician who had to resign because of plagiarism he fell down because of uh, a wiki it was called Gutenberg, where uh, normal people and scientists, scholars, found um, plagiats in, in, in his work, in his do doctoral thesis. And this wouldn't have been possible um, 20 years ago, or not in, in that, uh, in that um, small, small amount of time, in this uh, short period, for sure. And yeah, coming back to the question about Scansus, um, it's funny because I prepared a lecture. And, um, one main topic is uh, Timothy's theory. And um, when I understood Tim right, it's um, like you first have um, the crisis and then there's the scandal. But it can be the other way around, for example. Um, if there's a scandal causing moral outrage, you can um, be in the middle of a huge crisis, for example, in talk scandals. We talked about that last week. Um, if a politician or a CEO says something in front of the camera, which is uh, kind of outraging, um, it can be the other thing around. But I think it's it's really fruitful to think about both concepts. Um, every scandalized person organization is in a crisis, for sure. Excellent, excellent. I want to pivot now to uh, thinking a little bit more about character assassination. Um, this came up in the the q a in the chat and was something that we wanted to talk about as well so i'll toss it out now um folks at at carp and at scandology and of course tim um do do you have thoughts on the relationship between what we tend to call today cancel culture and character assassination i know there's more to delve into there than we could talk about uh for hours and hours um but how does this this sort of more modern phenomenon or maybe it isn't a modern phenomenon of cancel culture uh in impact and um, help maybe drive uh, character assassination. Um, Martin has his hand up. Yeah, um, I think cancel culture, at least as we see it today and have seen it in the past years, really is a modern phenomenon that, that for a large part depends on social media and the fact that everyone now has a voice and everyone can speak out and people can uh, much easier organize themselves to uh, basically boycott a person, which which is uh, what, what you're doing, trying to bring, bring them down. You could certainly see that as a form of character attack with the uh, caveat that whether or not it's a justified attack uh, doesn't really matter to our definition of it. But um, I wouldn't say that, I mean, many character attacks are not about canceling. Um, 
they, they are launched by a particular individual or a political party that wants to gain something uh, and therefore wants to weaken the opposition. Uh, and that's, I think, different from the moral outrage that often drives cancel culture. Uh, of course, that can also be manipulated, but it seems to come more from below, as it were. Um, it, it seems to be more uh, the, the masses taking aim at a particular person rather than, for instance, one politician taking a snipe at another one. So Martin, as our, our sort of resident historian, you would say that we don't really find examples of canceling throughout history, at least not the way that it happens today. Yeah, I've, I've thought about it, but I can't really think of many good examples where it's really, I mean, at least if you take that bottom up criterion uh, as, as, uh, as important. I mean, of course, people have been canceled in the past. I mean, the Catholic Church has excommuni excommunicated people for centuries, for instance. But uh, a bottom up uh, cancel culture where moral outrage among the, the people led to the cancellation of some public figure, um, I think really hangs together with modern mass media and, and you wouldn't really find it uh, before, let's say, the 20th or 19th century. Serge, what are your thoughts on cancel culture and character assassination? Uh as someone who is looking at character assassination from a more sociological perspective, uh, I think there is time also to look at both the sociology of cancel culture and the communication aspect of cancel culture, or the strategies of cancellation, as we call them, right? Like a um, kind of a call outs, public call outs, and the products that they create. And uh, that refers to a lot of research uh, related uh, to like public stigma and uh, social ostracism and public shaming and their uh, kind of roles in society because they also can be used as sanctioning mechanisms by uh, moral uh, entrepreneurs and some other agents of change. Uh, that's why I think uh, there is also future of uh, maybe future research of character assassination and moral conflict. Uh, which is a really powerful concept that was uh, developed by Pierce and Little John back in the 80s. Excellent. Eric, what are your thoughts? We'll say briefly, uh, certainly, uh, in addition to what Serge and Martin suggested, uh, that uh, canceling somebody is not just a di uh, dichotomy. You're either uh, canceled or you're allowed to, to, to be alive in the public memory or in, in the media. It's a continuum. And we see uh, today with the social media, it was in the past an increased attempt or attempts to from governments and, and organized groups to define who was a good person and who was a bad person. And the measure of uh, goodness and, and badness in those individuals. Look at, look at Mao in China, he was an idol in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, in the 1990s, his reputation fell. China was reforming. Now he's back on pedestal. Same thing, same thing about, about uh, uh, Stalin in Russia or Catherine II in Russia, a German-born emperor, well, uh, princess and became empress. And well, her image today, I just read the reports just is, is improving in Germany to show that it was a German princess was able to rule Russia and provide for Russia greatness. So it's a continuum. And again, once again, social media today allow governments in particular just define who was good, who was bad in, in history. Excellent, excellent. Um, I, I want to think, you know, Tim has has shared some ideas about, you know, the importance of analyzing the situation of leading with empathy for the victims of a uh, corporate crisis. Um, or an organizational crisis, but I'm curious from the perspectives of character assassination and, and scandals what your research tells us about how and when or if to respond to character attacks and to diffuse scandals. So maybe I'll pivot this question first to Serge and then to one of our, our folks from Scandology. What do we know about how, when, and if to respond to attacks or scandals? Uh, well, I guess uh, I should take it first. And obviously I've been thinking a lot about this and I do agree with actually a team's approach to uh, reputation management where we have to look at the uh, pre-crisis 
actual ongoing crisis and the post-crisis. And the last stage is actually least explored. And I think it actually, we need to spend more time on actually doing what happens after crisis and the lessons learned and teachable moments. Uh, so uh, I've been uh, in, in our recent uh, book uh, where I wrote chapter on responding to character assassination. I was looking at how uh, public relations is used, inoculation theory um, and issues management used in the pre-crisis stages. And then I was looking at uh, team's work, uh, image repair theory, and also uh, image prepare, new concept by uh, uh, our friend um, from Dar Dartmouth College, uh, just bl blanking on me. Uh, Josh Compton. Uh, Josh, Josh Compton, exactly. Uh, it's great new novel concept that could be used during crisis. And then in the post-crisis, I mean, there are a lot of uh, CSR efforts and ways to kind of uh, getting back to normal could be used. And there is a lot of research done by actually Kathy Rowan, who is here right now and in, in the audience, and Peter Stan Sandman and many other scholars in crisis communication. So obviously we can actually uh, still need to um, uh, summarize and curate all this great knowledge and uh, see how we can actually make this nice marriage between character assassination and crisis communication literature. Excellent, excellent. The interdisciplinary perspective that we love so much. Um, Andre or Hendrik, thoughts? Yeah, um, Andre, why don't you take over? Ooh. Deflecting my putting you all on the spot. I love it. <laughs> thoughts on how or if or when to respond to a scandal as it unfolds? Excuse me, connection. Just broke a little bit down. Um, yeah, I think I wrote about that. Um, it depends on the complexity of the accusations. Um, for example, if, if the complexity is really, really high, um, only 1% or 2% of the population understands it, I think it's good to say nothing, <laughs> do not respond. Um, we also talked about the complex scandals in last week, um, the, the worldwide scandals, for example, the Panama Papers or others. Um, a huge complexity and we had the impression that most news stories only came up when uh, it was possible to personalize the accusations for example uh, when it comes to famous uh, sports uh, sport players or, or politicians or um, celebrities so it depends on the the complexity i think if a celebrity hits a child in public it's not very complex <laughs> Maybe there is no, no chance to restore your, your image or repair your image uh, in the next years. Uh, but if the complexity is high, for example, when it comes to technical terms um, and also when, when nobody is really hurt, for example, tax evasion is, um, many people say it's a crime without victims. That's not true. We are all <laughs> victims of, of tax evasion, but for sure it's uh, too abstract, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. There's there was a question or a conversation happening in the chat here that I think is is useful and interesting for thinking about responses to uh, organizational crises or uh, potential reputational crises of organizations. So I'm curious um, what our our panelists here think about the role of scapegoats and uh, how or if they help an organization dodge accountability. Um, but uh, what what is the role of scapegoats in dealing with organizational crises? And maybe I'll, I'll punt that one to Tim first. Yeah, the, the scapegoat idea um, is, is, is kind of, I would say now passe in, in crisis management as a strategy, because you need to be accountable for other things going on on around you. And, and that's why I use this term accountability and not responsibility, because I might not be responsible for something, but I can be accountable for it. Okay. And I think organizations have learned they, they need to be accountable among their publics. That doesn't mean they all are, or they choose to choose to embrace. As I, I mentioned before, but escape be more responsible or someone who is responsible. And, and you can't do that anymore. And the supply chain is a good example of that. If a supplier messes up and let's go back, Mattel had the case where one of their suppliers put lead paint into children's toys. Well, we know you, that's, that's bad, that shouldn't be done. Well, that's still Mattel's. 
that's on them. I mean, they can't say like, well, you know, we told our supplier not to do it, but they did it anyway. So it's, it's their fault. Anytime you start to scapegoat, you see a very negative reaction from your stakeholders. They, they, don't, they don't like that. that. That's why I think organizations do it much more creatively nowadays. They scapegoat without scapegoating in, in many ways. But I, I think I prefer that they go more on the accountability side. And the reasons you the reason scapegoating is enticing is it's a way of saying, oh, I can limit my responsibility, I can limit my damage. Yeah, that's probably not going to work for most of your stakeholders. So I, I think it's I, I think it's now passe. At one point in time, I think you could get away with that. I think it's very tough nowadays to do that. And it, even if you go back to with the, the Firestone Ford with the blowouts on, on the SUVs back in, in the, that was like the early 2000s, they just tried to scapegoat one another and no one was happy with that. And like Firestone blames Ford, Ford blames Firestone. If you're like, well, why doesn't anyone do something about it? That's why when a company does make a statement where they take accountability, you see very positive responses to them on social media. It's like, oh, wow, someone actually stepped up and was willing to take responsibility. Is there's... An immediate downside to taking accountability, but it's an investment in a long, it's a long-term, it's, it's a longer-term gain. I'm going to take a quick hit to my reputation, but my rich reputation, according to the data that, that's out there, is going to rebound faster and more strongly if I take that hit early on. So I would say scapegoating is kind of, at least for corporations, is rather passe. You know, I think politicians can still get away with it. <laughs> I, would, I, I think that's the, the appropriate follow up then uh, for either the scandology or the character assassination researchers. Do we still see scapegoating happening in, in political discourse or other areas besides uh, corporate communication? Yeah, you just mentioned it. Um, I think it's a pretty normal instrument in political communication and political landscape to scapegoat somebody. That's kind of normal. For example, if there is a donation scandal or something similar, um, the first um, persons uh, who have to resign is the, you know, the second leak, not not the high, not the high flyers, not the, not the presidents or chairmen of parties. So this is kind of normal, but um, in most cases, what I witnessed, it doesn't help for a long time, because in the end, journalists will investigate further on, they're whistleblowers, um, some voters of the, the, the opponent party is, is uh, are becoming uh, more and more aggressive about the, the, the accusation. And then often the chairman or chairwoman has to resign. Excellent. Other thoughts from the, the character assassination researchers? Yeah, um, I, I think scapegoating often pertains to a group as well. Uh, I remember recently a politician saying that all the traffic jams in the Netherlands were due to letting in so many immigrants. Excellent, excellent. Yep, that seems seems right on. No notes there. Excellent. Serge? <laughs> well, uh, we also have this concept of killing the messenger and uh, obviously uh, um, bloodthirsty public wants heads roll in crisis situations, so you really have to find a scapegoat to uh, remove. Usually it's an intern or it's whoever voices opinion about crisis on television, so must go first. And that's basically one way to um, kind of um, satisfy some kind of public outrage, but I'm sure Tim might um, uh, come a, kind of uh, provide his perspective on this because it's kind of an old tradition of how you handle crisis back yeah. in the days yeah no that that that's a valid point that you know if you think of the scapegoat as someone in the organization who you're going to fire yeah that happens a lot like it, it tends to be the, the people at the top the ceo he or she is is gone you know they they resign and you know fall on fall on their swords however you, you view it but that yeah people people do need to go and that's part of proving you're taking action by getting rid of those people, yeah. That is a very concrete thing you can point to in terms of an action that an organization has has taken. Eric, what are your thoughts? Yes, very, uh, Jennifer, thank you. Very concrete thing. It's just there's a scandal in character assassination, scapegoating of uh, Mr. Zucker in NBC. Uh, that's it's what, what people say, how people say, multiple reports and, and guesses, we don't know exactly, but well, uh, that he took a fall because of a basic restructuring in CNN. Uh, CNN, basic restructuring, and he was chosen 
to be attacked and he resigned and the scandal of erupted well simply because he was chosen to be a scapegoat by the superiors who bought cnn talk about cnn he was former nbc official of course so that's just scapegoating character assassination scandal same time with just unfolding in front of our eyes all coming together and a a, a, a recent example as well I have um, maybe two or three more questions we want to try to get to before wrapping things up here. Um, and one, I, I'm curious, um, there was some debate in the chat about whether the values of an organization actually matter um, to consumers. And certainly, you know, Tim had pointed out that many of us still may patronize businesses or organizations that we don't like, even if we uh, find or for the reason that we find them convenient. But I, I'm curious, Tim, if, if you have any research or if there's any data on to what extent uh, consumers really do choose to patronize organizations whose values are in line with them. In other words, to what extent does an organization's value system really matter? It, uh, people will always say it matters more than it really does, but that's been a consistent theme since they started looking at sort of responsible behavior. People are like, oh, I always shop by that. And it's like, yeah, you, you, you get them and, and really they don't. Uh, what it amounts to, and the latest data I've seen coming out of a fairly large study done in management is that if you are in a market and you have a small market share, values can really matter to you because you can go out and you can make statements related to reflect your values, and those might be, you know, you're going to take a stand on a social issue. You can then attract customers to you based upon that. However, if you are the dominant share within the market, you, you dominate the market, you have the biggest share, the odds are you will probably lose more than you will gain. So it, it's, it's not, then the values aren't as important to you. And that, that kind of reduces it down just to the numbers and takes out the ethical component to it. But what companies need to do nowadays is to kind of figure out what their values are because they've gotten to a point in time and we know some companies clearly for their values. You know, Patagonia was founded upon values. You know, the body shop has values. Chick-fil-A, like them or not, they have values that they believe in. And the reason I think companies need to clarify, and we talk about purpose and uh, you know purpose driven got to be a little bit of, of of a buzzword but corporations need to figure out and this is all about companies need to figure out who they are you know, I, I watch a lot of premier football and they always say teams that struggle are teams that don't know who they are and that's the same for corporations you don't know who you are you're going to struggle and you if you say what your values are then that can guide you because right now you're entering into a landscape that is really fraught with a lot of dangers because you're being expected to speak on all these social issues that you don't know anything or much at all about. And because, you know, I, you were a lumber company, then suddenly you're talking about, well, how do you feel about Black Lives Matter? It's like, well, I never thought about that. We just hire people like cut down on a processed trees. And so you have to figure out what your values are and then those can guide you in the social issues. And if you do that right, you're, you're, you should come out fine. But you're, you're just, li we're living in an environment now where you're always gonna be loved and hated. It's, it's, there's, there's so much polarization, going back to, to the theme for the this conference of Scandology. And that's challenging for companies. And so you just kind of need to pick your, you can't keep wavering. You kind of need to pick your values. So I, I think at heart, values have that benefit to you. They can guide your actions in the futures, but just jumping on values can have a benefit if you're a small company, small market share, but large companies probably aren't going to see that type of benefit. That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to go to Andre and then I'm going to put together some two comments that I still see floating around in the chat and then we will wrap up here. But Andre first. Thanks a lot. Um, I second that, Tim. And that will, would also say it has to do with uh, the type of market. For example, if you have a sustainable um, business model, Many, many small companies, startups uh, are coming in the, uh, were coming in the last years, uh, building up um, green, um, a green market, or, or as you want, might want to call it. Um, it depends on the market. And also, CSR reports become more and more relevant, especially and also for um, larger companies. Many investors um, want that CSR report, and um, they look exactly into it and see if it is taken seriously or not. Uh, and 
of course, and is, if it's not connected to your business model, that, that reminds me of, uh, maybe you saw the, the Netflix special of Bo Burnham, where he had this song, Social Brand Consultant, completely claims out of nothing about uh, values um, who have, have nothing, nothing to do with the companies he mentioned. That's what many, many companies are doing right now. Interesting, interesting. So, so the relevance um, to the, the corporate identity matters. Um, so I want to put together a really great question from Eric Desenhall in the chat, along with a comment from Quentin about whether moral outrage can sometimes be uh, deflected to distract from real important issues like a company's labor or environmental records. Um, and, and Eric asks or notes that uh, much crisis thinking assumes that attacks on people or organizations are actually legitimate and that critics are honest folks engaging and trying to promote their values. But it seems um, that in reality, there are motivated adversaries that can never be placated. And that, um, as Eric says, almost all apologies today are deemed to have been botched because the job of critics and the media is to just sort of keep hitting the organization. Um, so maybe is there a positivity bias, assuming that these strategies will make us feel better when in reality, we're just sort of arguing with trolls whose job it is to just keep, keep, keep uh, bringing down organizations. So do either um, of our, our sort of three communicating parties have thoughts on the legitimacy of adversaries or of some of the claims against organizations? And is there a sense in which some of this moral outrage can be used to distract from what we might consider as more important issues? I realize that's a big question, but. Oh, um, yeah, uh, ab absolutely, that's the case. Um, and that's why I, I think that the same way there's a bias, like anytime someone attacks, they win, there's a bias that was just because they attack that there's a legitimate concern. And that's, you know, the, the challenge for managers is to figure out what's legitimate and what's not, what's going to spread and what isn't. And what's, what are just the groups trying to come out there and, and troll you and to try to get a, try to get a reaction out of you. That's why you know, when you're, that's one of the differences between like why well, I say this is a pair that sums a pair of crisis I manage a risk versus a crisis. In a crisis, I really have to deal with it because something's going on and, and it's negatively affecting people. But in a pair of crisis, I can choose to just ignore it or I can come back and say they're they're just blatantly wrong. They, they're giving you they're misrepresenting the facts. And you see this now. I mean, that, that's one of the rising you see on a lower level, but a rising concern about misinformation or disinformation, which is purposeful misinformation about corporations that are being put out there that are that are threats to organizations and how they need to deal with that because because they they can still be damaging. But yeah, there are times you you have to fight back uh, um, uh, from from these attacks and say no, that what, what they're doing is is completely completely misrepresented what we're doing and, and doesn't have anything to do with it. So yeah, I I I think that's right on the point for it. Excellent. Thoughts from any of our other panelists? Okay, if the answer is no. Just like to add that um, maybe individualization is a central concept of, um, to answer this question. You know, um, um, through more and more individualization, more and more people um, think they have to defend their own values, uh, their special values, and uh, combined with social media, the social web, it's much more easier to, to um, yeah, provoke outrage. Excellent. I'm going to go to Serge, who will get the last word on this, and then I will move to wrapping us up. Uh, yeah, uh, you know my kind of uh, philosophy. I, I do believe that we need to spend more time actually studying the media business models and the mediatization as the some of the commercial logic of the media and the way why they produce clickbait and how kind of it uh, really, really, it's important. And as we know, a character assassination and negativity of the currency of today's media, basically, I mean, that's how they make money. And instead of it, we're talking about the ethics of the media and the professional logic, which sometimes it's out of context. So we really need to kind of like spend more time understanding um, many ways that Canadian School of Media has done in terms of media ecology. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and again, another uh, important uh, point about the need to take a broad interdisciplinary approach to doing a lot of this research. I know there were a lot of great questions in the chat and we didn't get to all of them, um, but I want to wrap us up here so we don't take too terribly much time, uh, much more of your time on a Friday afternoon. But thank you from the bottom of our intellectual hearts and brains for joining us in a great conversation today. Again, we at at CARP Lab are, are hosting this webinar in conjunction with the Scandology Research Initiative as a way to continue to bring together our line of work. And we were so excited to welcome Timothy Coombs to talk with us today because his research, as you clearly saw, sits very um, neatly at the intersection of the research that we do. Two quick announcements to wrap up. Unfortunately, I don't have another webinar for next Friday to tell you about. So um, enjoy spending next Friday, not with us. Um, but uh, Tim and our Scandologists have mentioned the Scandology 4 official conference. And I see that Andre has put the link in the chat there if you are interested in submitting an abstract to attend that conference. The deadline is May 15th. Likewise, um, uh, if you want to know more about what's happening with CARP Lab, you can follow us on Twitter at CARP underscore lab or email Sergey, who will put his email in the chat about joining our mailing list to get more information about our upcoming events. And I know there is a Scandology mailing list as well that um, our, our friends here can put in the chat. Um, but please join me in thanking Tim Coombs for being with us today to have a great conversation. And again, thank you all for being here to participate in this conversation and really driving it forward with your wonderful comments and questions. So thank you again and have a great rest of your Friday.